name is Ed Lear. I'm the CTO of Real Labs. I'm a former astronaut, astrophysicist, electrical engineer, and a pilot. And uh, I got my start in the space industry uh, almost 30 years ago when I sent in an application to become an astronaut. I was working as a scientist, as an astrophysicist, research scientist. And uh, I was a wrestling coach. I was pilot, living life in Hawaii. And a friend of mine said, we can send it, you know, you, you know, you can apply to become an astronaut. And I thought, oh, that would be fun. So I sent in an application, like saying, I'm in Houston, Texas. So I've had the experience of being on board the space station when being told by mission control, hey, we have an object that's coming really close to we don't think it's going to hit, but it's going to be coming really close, and we need you to get prepared for closing off the hatches. If something does hit you, you know, um, it's not going to be good, and, and we need you to get ready to evacuate. And, uh, and that sort of thing does happen more and more frequently on the space station. So I knew about the issue. I also knew it was, at the time, very, very difficult to do because the, the tracking for these objects in space jump in orbit around the Earth created by, by humans is uh, quite difficult because some of these objects are quite small. And, you know, something at this size, you know, a thousand miles away is difficult to track. But the U.S. does it, other company, other countries do do it, but there was no commercial companies that could do such a thing. And so I said, well, first off, you know, this company has to exist. But how in the world can you do this? Because the U.S. Department of Defense spends billions of dollars on these radars to track these things. How can you build your own radars to do such a thing when they cost billions of dollars. When there is no monitoring of space, as there wasn't uh, in the past, even if you have all well, the well-intentioned rules against creating debris or trash in space, who follows it if you know nobody's watching? What if I had a highway and I specifically told everybody, there is no way anybody can monitor your speed on this highway. What do you think people will drive on that highway? Will they all be driving 65 miles an hour? I guarantee not. And that is that was the case. So I think, you know, the, the very act of monitoring is extremely important. But the active services we provide to prevent things from being hit and, and operating safely is going to be crucial to the further commercial uses, commercial, scientific, and exploration uses of space. We've been building radars for scientific purposes, uh, measuring the, the northern lights, the aurora. And it turns out that we've been tracking objects in space using this as a byproduct of us tr uh, studying the aurora for the National Science Park. In fact, all these objects moving through our radar beams were considered noise. We were carefully clipping these things out of our data because it was polluting our data set of the aurora. And at some point, com uh, companies and uh, customers started asking, Hey, you know all that data you're throwing away that you're carefully picking out? Can we buy that from you? That's when they realized there was a company. Eh? And I said, well, okay, so A, I know there's a business here. But B, how can you build radar like this but don't cost billions of dollars? They said, well, do you want to see one? And they had one out in the back parking lot of SRI. Uh, that It was made from uh, leftover equipment from one of these uh, scientific radars. That's when they were tracking objects in space. Ooh, I was amazed and I said, well, first off, okay, I get you can build this, but how accurate is this? How many meters can you measure the position of something? And Mike said, well, 15 meters. I said, no way. Yeah, uh, you know, that's at the limit. I knew that that's at the limit of what uh, Department's events can do with a billion dollar rare. And he goes, Well, you want to see the data? Pulls out the data with them. I was shocked. But okay. 
how, how well can you determine the velocity Chris? Of, oh, under a meter per second. Is, there's no way. Want to see the data? It pulls it out. And when I saw that, I was just flabbergasted. And, uh, and they said, well, you know, because our whole goal for building scientific equipment is usability and low cost because you don't have a lot of money. <laughs> thing that changed most about my viewpoint uh about life from having been involved in the space program is an appreciation for the things that human beings can do if we work together if you look at the things that we do uh, that we have made possible uh, they are absolutely staggering and they could have only happened by having a large number of people cooperating to work together on something and, uh, you know, I had a, uh, a crewmate on my very first flight, a uh, French astronaut named Jean-Francois Clairbot. And uh, he, he made a good statement. He, we were on our last day of my first mission. We had everything packed up. We were ready to go home the next morning. So we basically had a few hours to just sort of sit and watch the Earth go by. We had the space shuttle flying upside down and tail forward, so backwards, to avoid being hit by space debris in the windows. Um, so, but that made it a bit, so there's an overhead window on the space shuttle, which was looking straight down at the Earth. So it felt like you were in, an, in a glass bottom boat cruising above the surface of the Earth. So Jean-Francois were both sitting on the ceiling, because you can if you want. We, were, we had our feet by the, uh, the overhead window looking down. So like looking down to, it felt like looking down through the floor at the earth going by. And we were just sitting there eating our dehydrated food. <laughs> uh, Jean-Francois said, you know, there are times when I think, wow, human beings can do anything if we work together. Look at this. We're in an orbiting spaceship. We're going 18,000 miles an hour and we're, we're, we're going all around the earth every 90 minutes. Amazing. And, but then at the other times, I think, you know, you look that way and you see, you can see the Milky Way, you know, as, as we go around, we're on the dark side of the earth. He goes, look how big the universe is. Look how big the earth is. You know, at 18,000 miles an hour, it still takes us 90 minutes to go all the way around the earth. And, and, you know, most of this is uninhabited. You can see big swaths of nothingness out there. The universe is big. So at one hand, I think, man, humans are really big because we can do these amazing things. On the other hand, we're really small because look how insignificant we are compared to the size of all of the universe out there. He goes, well, I guess both of these are true at the same time. <laughs> and I always remember that comment because I think he's right. Um, both are true at the same time. We can do amazing things, but we shouldn't forget how big and beautiful the universe is.